may have noticed if you are keeping an eye on the repository that there's lots more homework for you. <laughs> uh, I thought I'd just briefly point to bits of it at the start of this lecture. I mean, what did we look at uh, in part one yesterday? Um, uh, we kind of we looked at some basic vector stuff and how we used vectors to build normal functors and uh, sort of some connection between normal functors and being traversable. Um, and then at the end of that, there was a kind of quick glimpse of uh, you know, building uh, tree-like structures by taking at least fixed points of normal functors in, uh, in this style. Uh, so one of the things I've done here is to define uh, the, uh, the natural numbers as, the, uh, as a tree in this, this style. So yeah, so the normal function specifies what one node of a natural number looks like, and it's, it's one of two possibilities. Uh, and then given, then we have to explain for each possibility what the size of the vector of children should be. So if you, if you choose uh, the zero constructor, there will be no children. And if we choose the, the successor constructor, there will be one child. Then when we take the fixed point, we get the natural number. So here is what the actual zero looks like. And here is what the successor looks like. So packing up here, the choice of zero and the empty vector being well typed. Here we choose the successor option and we pack up um, a, uh, uh, a singleton vector with the predecessor in it. And you'll notice that because comma is right nested, so this is the comma of the pairing and this is the cons of the vector. Um, uh, so it just looks like there's a constructor on the front of a, of a bunch of, of arguments. Um, so then your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to show that these really are the natural numbers by proving that the principle of mathematical induction holds for. We can see that we can build um, uh, we have something that behaves like zero, and we have something that behaves like successor, but we really want to know that uh, that is all there is, and that we can know when we have uh, uh, a natural number which one it is. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is certainly doable. It's even not that difficult. So, have fun with that. Uh, the next challenge is a little bit more exciting, but. Um, uh, and it involves heavy use of width uh, and the occasional helper function. Um, but uh, it is this to, to show that if you have a normal functor where the set of shapes is decidable, then the resulting tree structure has a decidable importance. Think about that. Um, yeah, hopefully, intuitively, it makes it makes sense because these things. Well, what does a node consist of? It, some sort of shape label plus finitely many children. So, uh, if you can you know, test the quality of the children in finite time, uh, and you can decide the equality of the shapes, you should be laughing. But uh, one of the things to note, right, you really need that you are deciding equality here and producing either, well, certainly you need to produce equality evidence in the positive case. Because if you think about it, 
You want to know that it makes sense to compare children in corresponding positions of your two nodes. How do you know that they have corresponding positions? You actually need to make use of the fact that you have already checked that the shapes were equal in order to force the sizes to be equal and then it makes sense uh, to compare elements in corresponding positions. So this is one of those situations where it's important to produce evidence to a higher standard than we're used to from simply type programming in order uh, to manipulate dependent type programs properly. What else <coughs> happened? Oh yes, I threw in this amusing little exercise for you. You're having fun with the, uh, with the structures. Um, we had there's some stuff about applicative homomorphisms. Um, and uh, so I'm asking you to show that if you have a homomorphism between applicative functors, uh, that gives you a whole new uh, applicative functor given by their, their co product. Um, and uh, if you want to think about it like this, if you have, if, if you think of uh, applicative functors as capturing some sort of uh, possible dirtiness. You know, so there's, there's pure things and then there's some dirt around. Then uh, uh, having an applicative homomorphism says, yeah, from, from F to G, says there's at least as much dirt available in G as in F. Um, so, um, so this is saying, well, I mean, for an appropriately vague notion of dirt. Uh, so this is saying, well, things are either known only to be F dirty, or else they're G dirty. Um, the other, I, what I should have done, I should add this to this exercise, is that there is, of course, a pair of applicative homomorphisms. Uh, there's an applicative homomorphism from F to F plus G and from G to F plus G. So, uh, uh, since, yeah, so what we're saying is, you know, every applicative homomorphism gives you a new applicative functor, which gives you two new applicative homomorphisms. So, uh, uh, they're just, you know, they're, they're like rabbits. Uh, uh, what else is going on? Had a look at that stuff. Yes. Then we had a look at some lambda terms. We built things like um, uh, substitution and built some modern conveniences. And then I I, um, I built a kind of guided implementation exercise uh, for um, normalizing uh, simply type lambda calculus two different ways. One is by hereditary substitution, um, where you say, I've got some variable and I've got some term, the same type as the variable, built over the context without that variable. And I should be able to substitute that through uh, in a, yeah, when I say that, actually, let me be careful. The point is to characterize the normal forms and then to define substitution as an operation only on the normal forms, which means that if your substitution has, you know, creates a, a relax, you have to normalize it away, uh, straight away. Um, so uh, the amusing thing is that it's possible to do it without really trying in a manner which is structurally recursive. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, that, that, that's a bit of fun for you. Uh, and then um, I give a kind of more, well, it's not entirely conventional treatment of normalization uh, by evaluation, uh, which is uh, uh, another way of looking at it. And here, when I'm giving a semantics to arrow types, I'm obliged 
to introduce a, uh, some kind of cryptic model in order to cope with the possibility that things might be used in larger contexts than the context they came from. Um, so uh, that means there's lots of renaming all over the place. It's a slightly unconventional treatment of normalization by evaluation if you know about these sorts of things because in the middle, in the representation of the value, so the idea, if, if you know about normalization by evaluation, then this is boring. If you don't, then this might be interesting. The idea is that you go from terms to a representation of values which uses the actor function space to represent the behavior of things of the functional type. And then the, uh, once you've built values in this way, you quote them back as normal forms in a first order syntax. And the, the slightly strange thing that I've done is that I have allowed a representation of uh, syntactic things of ground type, so of a function type, not just of ground type, in the representation of values. So values don't have to be fully eaten or expanded. But even so, the, uh, the normal forms will still be fully eaten or expanded. Uh, and I think it comes out slightly more easily than the usual treatment. Do that. So, have fun with that. Uh, yes, and then I make all sorts of ridiculous suggestions for ways in which you might modify your normalization by evaluation algorithm to add lots of extra features, none of which I did yesterday. Uh, so, knock yourselves out. Uh, and then we get to today's material. So, maybe I should. Pull up an actual e maps. It's an actual. And talk about um, containers. Just make sure that my idiot cards are in front of me. Um, okay. Um, I mean, everybody happy so far? Um, good. So. Uh, containers are the um, uh, a generalization of normal functors. Uh, so where uh, normal functors, we have shapes, and then we compute from a given shape the size uh, of the vector of the substructure. With containers, we just say, uh, but there's just going to be some set of uh, positions for, uh, for substructures. Uh, and then the interpretation of a container is that you provide, so, a con so this container with, with a set of shapes shh, and a family of positions po, uh, it acts on x by saying, um, well, first of all, you, you, give a, you give two things. You, you choose a shape, and then you give a function which maps positions to elements. Uh, and if I make use of this lovely whiteboard, I can write the same expression in a more uh, mathematical notation. So writing the sigma as a sum, and then I'll write the, the function space as an exponential. So what we've got is that S triangle P of X is need to practice that um, uh, is, uh, is this kind of generalized power series. Um, so that's sort of uh, combinatorial way of looking at it. Uh, so these uh, also characterize, well, you know, they, uh, 
they characterize more generically uh, you know, stuff with, uh, with elements inside. Uh, and you can see immediately that we've left behind uh, the, um, uh, uh, the finitary structures in that, yeah, if you choose shapes to be uh, one, uh, positions to be napped, then you define strings. Uh, so yeah, so these things, uh, they have, uh, well, you, um, they, they clearly, uh, they clearly subsume the normal functors, uh, but, uh, yeah, so that more of them, uh, and you can be, you can rely on fewer things working, but then you can constrain the bits. Uh, if you want other stuff to work. Uh, okay, so let's sort of do the usual sorts of things and make sure that the kind of kit that we might care about uh, is, um, uh, is expressible uh, in container form. Uh, so let's start easy. Uh, suppose we want to represent uh, the constant A functor as a container. Uh, and, uh, I also 
also included, some of you have been there already, uh, uh, some exercises for normal functors on uh, the, uh, the, the tensor operation you get when you replace the plus with the times. So in particular, to show that uh, it, uh, you can, uh, but it means the same thing either way around, up to isomorphism, and then it degenerates to a, to a composition. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, so we've got we've got our basic uh, polynomial bits and pieces, um, but we can actually be uh, more versatile than that. Um, uh, we've shown that they're closed under here uh, binary sums and binary products, but why not just close them under arbitrary sums and products? Uh, so let's just just go for it. Um, so yeah, so we've got in each case we've got a set, and then we've got a family of containers, and we want to represent the container that means uh, building, um, uh, you know, that that means sort of choosing a, a, one of the structures in the uh, in the family. Uh, so the shape is going to have to be, well, first of all, choose an A. Uh, and then uh, choose uh, a shape that corresponds to whichever branch of the family that A brings us to. So that will be... Uh, shape projection composed for C. And then what about positions? Well, much like uh, with the binary sum, we'll just need the positions corresponding to the branch of the family that we're in. So let's get ourselves uh, our A and shape, uh, and then we can say, well, we need the positions for C of A that go with the shape S. And then if you are uh, a raving uh, code golfer, you can see that this expression can be made smaller and less comprehensible, but I'm not going to do that. Um, Okay, products are a little bit more amusing in this respect. Um, so now we've got uh, a family of containers, and instead of wanting to choose a structure from one branch of the family, we want to collect the whole series, the whole collection you know, all the um, of all the structures in the family. So, we are going to need um, not just one shape chosen from the family, but for every container in the family we need a shape. So that's to say, we're going to have to give it, I should actually have to find pi as a, uh, as a function. Function that chooses a shape for every branch of the family. We're making an infinitary collection of all of these things. And then, uh, uh, what happens now? So we get our function, uh, which, which can tell us a shape for everything in the family. What's the position going to be? How do you point to one element inside a big product of lots of structures? Yeah. First of all, you choose which of the structures you're in. 
That's to say, you pick your A, and then you choose uh, which, uh, which position you're at within that structure. So that's to say, uh, we have position in, uh, in C of A, according to whatever the shape was that was chosen by the function. That. Okay. So, uh, so everybody cool about that arbitrary generalization to uh, uh, all the sums and all the products. Okay. And then now, without doing any adding up of sizes or anything like that, we immediately know what composition is. Right? Because what is one of these things? It's a sum of a product of things. And if we're trying to compose that with a, if the things are themselves containers, then what we've got is a sum of a product of containers. We've just shown that containers are closed under sums and products. So we can just write it down. Right. So yeah, so this is the sum over S of the product over P of S of C's. Um, so yeah. We can write on something that has the right type and is vaguely believable. Um, let's let me just normalize that for you. We have um, uh, let me just write S P C R O um, S. Half sensible. Yeah, okay. So you can see here what the shapes are and what below what the positions are. So the shape of the composite, remember, S and P are for the outer structure and C is for the inner structure. So the shape of the composite is first of all an outer shape and then a mapping from outer positions to inner shapes. That's exactly what you would need to describe all of the shape information in the composition. And then, again, the, um, uh, the positions in the composite are like the path, the two-step path. Uh, first of all, you choose which of the outer positions you're at, and that will take you to one of your inner structures, and then you have to decide where the element is inside that uh, inner structure. So, I mean, these things really have uh, a very clear geometric intuition. The reason why I like to write, why I write triangles and why the triangle is this way around is that I, I think of these structures as being like tree structures where you store a shape at the apex of the triangle and then the base of the triangle actually represents the position set, which is mapped to something or other. So here, if we're looking at, at composites, there's a, a C-like structure. So the shape information is uh, what's stored inside uh, the, uh, the triangles. That's to say, we need an S here and a function that takes these things to, to those shapes. And then here's our here's the surface where we actually attach the, uh, the elements. Okay, everybody happy so far? Right. Um, these things uh, also have a sensible 
notion of morphism. So the idea is that a container morphism is supposed to represent natural transformations uh, between containers. Uh, so the idea is this should work no matter what elements you're storing in the containers, you need to be able to take a container, one sort of container, and unpack it and repack the bits and pieces up as another sort of container. So if you think about what that could possibly consist of, um, you, um, uh, you know, in order to choose the output shape, what information do you have available? Uh, well, you have the input shape. You have a function that gives you input elements, but you don't know what type the input elements are, so you can't do anything with that function. So the only thing you could possibly do is compute the, um, uh, the output shape from the input shape. Okay? Meanwhile, in order to deliver the structure, the output shape has to populate its, or the output container has to populate its positions with elements. But those elements are of uh, your. Uh, that doesn't generalize the uh, morphisms of uh, you know, what you call null hunters. Yes, it does. Um, um, uh, yeah, except that here, this uh, the thing that behaves like the vector uh, in, in normal functions is this function. Uh, yeah, so we've got to populate all the positions in the output container with elements. And there's only one place we can reliably get those elements from, uh, because we don't know what the type is. The only thing that we have of that type is an input container which has some elements of that type in some positions. So what we need to do is explain from which input position each output position will fetch its element. So the morphisms between containers have uh, functions on shapes going one way and positions going back the other way. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, it's one of these things, so yeah. I suppose, okay, I've said that's what, what they are. Uh, of course I have to show that if we have a morphism specified in this way, then we know how to make it act on the input container type to deliver some output container. Um, so, uh, it, of course there's only one way to do it. So, um, <laughs> and, but let's see uh, what happens. Of course, then I have to convert it back from horror Unicode into lovely ASCII. Um, uh, and this time I will golf the uh, golf thing down a bit. Uh, and then, of course, I get a bar server. Um, yes. Uh, so what happens is uh, that indeed the the two part of the morphism is used to transform the shape, and then the the flow part of the morphism, going back the other way, is just wired into the original function that grabs the. Uh, uh, the element uh, from the input container. Uh, so it's just uh, a redirection. Um, okay, so everybody happy so far? Now well, there's an important exercise for you to do uh, in this respect, which is, it's not enough uh, 
to, to know that these morphisms have an action that is a polymorphic function, uh, what, uh, what it's good to show is how to represent any polymorphic function between containers as a container morphism. That's, that's the way around. Yeah, so essentially the inversion of this thing. Um, so that's, uh, that's a little, uh, little job for you to, to turn that around. It would be uh, uh, lovely to do better than that and prove internally that uh, uh, that's kind of uh, uh, the whole of the story for these sorts of functions, but that's um, that requires a degree of parametricity that's not internalized. Uh, we'll get there eventually, um, type theorists will, will get the hang of parametricity, but it, it's, it hasn't quite happened yet. Um, yeah, before I move on, I want to say something that I, I find really helpful when it comes to thinking about containers. We've kind of, uh, we've been talking about this geometric intuition for them as shapes of nodes and positions to plug children in, in tree structures. Um, but there's, uh, there's another way of looking at things, a kind of whole other metaphor for them, if you like, which is sort of, um, this comes from uh, Peter Hancock, which is to consider containers as describing uh, command response systems. So you just think of the shapes as being a set of commands that you're allowed to issue, uh, and the positions as the meaningful responses to those commands. And then, what is the uh, action of a container uh, on some x? It's a strategy for obtaining an x by one interaction. You, you, you say what command you're going to issue and how you will process the response in order to obtain an x. So it's a command response system. And then, um, we uh, should consider you know, what is a container morphism and uh, it's exactly uh, the uh, extremely obscure computing concept known as a device driver. <laughs> you have two command response systems, one of them is the master, the other is the slave. You give a command to the master, it figures out how to translate that as a command to the slave, which does its interaction, sends a response back, which is then translated to you. So, the, so you need to, to write a device driver, you need to be able to, uh, to translate uh, master commands to slave commands, and slave responses to master responses. We have multiple commands in the slave. That's, well, um, uh, you'll see what happens later on. Yes, but that's true. That just means that uh, that the slave, uh, that, that the command response structure for the slave is uh, not what you think it is. Uh, we'll get there in a minute. But we first of all need W types, uh, and then we can talk about uh, composite things. Um, but yeah, I think so. I think it's worth keeping both of these interpretations in mind. Both the kind of node structures of data way of looking at uh, uh, at containers and the uh, command response system way of, of looking at containers. Uh, they're, they're both very helpful ways of thinking about things. Uh, and then to try and interpret as command response systems uh, what, uh, uh, what things like the sums and products mean. Um, 
So the, uh, the sum means that you're going to choose which command response system to use. Um, the product means you choose which command, you choose a pair of commands, and the environment chooses which to respond to. Uh, the tensor that we were talking about, Hancock's tensor, uh, came from this view. He wanted to talk about lockstep uh, command response systems. So you, where you issue commands to two systems, and you get responses from two systems. Um, so uh, yeah, then you think about what composition means. Um, composition explains it's a kind of semicolon. Um, the, the composition of two command response systems uh, is given by saying what your first command is and how you're going to choose your next command depending on what comes back from the first one. Um, and uh, uh, then the response is just the sequence of responses that, that comes back. Uh, and if you think then if you compare that with the tensor, so the tensor is uh, that you're giving two commands and you're getting two responses <coughs> with no computational dependency of the second command on the first response. Yeah, you could give both commands at the same time. So that's why, uh, that's why the tensor can be swapped because there's no computational dependency. But that's why also it degenerates to a composition. You could give the commands one at a time. Uh, you're just ignoring the response from the first command when you choose the second command. Is this making some sort of sense? Yeah. So it's good to think of these things with, with both meanings. Um, right. Uh, so what happens next? Uh, well, we um, we built uh, we built data types from normal functors. So in exactly the same way, let's build data types uh, from containers. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, the least fixed point of a container is known as a W type. W for well ordering. Uh, and it's a sort of general purpose, uh, well founded data structure that you can do induction on. Um, and in an appropriately extensional setting, it's sort of the universal inductive type. You only wouldn't really need. Uh, so I've got some exercises for you in terms of uh, manufacturing uh, the, um, the natural numbers as a W type. Um, and um, uh, if you're following along in the notes, you'll see that I ask you to discover for yourselves why constructing the primitive recursor is okay but constructing the induction principle as you get to do for the normal functors is not okay. So yes, it's not going to work, but it will be illustrative to find out why. That's funny, what is it about the normal functor representation that lets you get the induction principles well, you know, compared to the container representation, which somehow lets you not quite get hold of them. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's an interesting little lesson, which I hope you will enjoy. Uh, but I thought I'd just uh, show you an example of building a, a data type this way. I built the binary trees. So first of all, we need to build um, the, uh, uh, we need to build a, a container that describes a node structure. So, uh, so how many 
how many shapes will we have? I'm just going to do an unlabeled binary tree. If we're going for either lead, you know, leads and nodes, then we're going to need two shapes. And, uh, and then, uh, depending on whether we choose lead or nodes, we will either have um, zero children or two. Uh, and then, in the case, if you want to build a leaf, then we have to build some stuff. Uh, we're going to go uh, left, uh, which is true. And then we need a function from the empty type. Uh, and you have two options. Um, you can either say, lambda my Aunt Fanny. Uh, or I have. Um, in, in my basics file, I have a function which is just called magic. Uh, um, right, so and then here we'll need a uh, uh, left and a right subtree. Uh, and what do we do? We say I'll do false. And then, uh, then we need a function from positions to subtrees. Uh, so uh, there are just, uh, so it's a function from two. So you know, we, uh, we say, well, I'll, uh, I'll either have S or T. Yeah, so what you have is, uh, is the pair of children encoded as a function uh, from the Booleans. Um, okay, so I'm, I'll not uh, I'll not try and write programs for this thing, uh, or, uh, uh, or or fail to prove the induction principle. You can enjoy that for yourselves. Um, I just I want to think about um, I want to think about this thing. Um, so yes. So if C is some uh, some container, uh, what's this thing? So I'm taking the fixed point of a container, which is built as the choice either of some constant x or of the C, which we gave. Trees with holes in the top X? Yeah, so it's, it's, I chucked in basically the, an extra leaf. Um, so at any given node, uh, if you think of it in terms of command response systems, uh, you know, at any given node in the tree, you can choose either to stop by handing over a value of type x or you can issue a command uh, and then carry on with your process once you, for each possible response you get. So what we have here are uh, the, uh, uh, the command response trees uh, which produce values of type X generated by uh, a, a command response system. That's to say, we have the free monad of the container. And of course, there's an exercise which asks you to show that that is indeed what it is. Uh, let me just fish that up. Yes. So, um, is that legible? Should I zoom in a little? Too much. Right. So that's the thing we just saw. 
to show it's the free monad. But then hang on a minute. Hey, look, folks. It's a set arrow set. And what is it? It's some sort of tree-like structure with places inside it for x's. That corresponding to the values and the leaves. In that case, it must be some sort of a container. So, uh, so your mission uh, is to show that not only can you take the free monad of a container, but that free that containers are closed under the free monad. So, if you really want to model the idea that uh, you have a master-slave uh, uh, device driver where each command from the master is going to be translated as a, some finite number of slave commands, then you take, then that's a container morphism from the master command response uh, interface to the free monad of the slave command response interface. So that lets you say, you know, uh, so, what's, so what is one of these things uh, in terms of shapes and positions? Uh, the, um, uh, the, the shape or the command of one of these things is not just one command, it's a whole program. It's your whole strategy for uh, describing how you're going to use this command response interface. And the response is from coming from reality, the trace of what happened when you ran that program. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, just as you know, in, uh, in Unix shell, you can write a, a strategy for issuing commands and then save that to an executable file and that becomes one command that you can issue uh, well that's uh, uh, that's what's uh, what's going on here the, the sort of the finitary arbitrary arbitrary planetary compositions of uh, the uh, the container structure that's a bit of fun for you. And uh, yeah, only a few things left. There's another exercise uh, for you here. Um, uh, so consider uh, that we might be interested in some command response structure. Uh, we, can, so we should be able to implement an operation uh, which takes a command and according to some strategy that's really difficult to think of, uh, you know, it's the strategy for running that command and returning a response. But, uh, I'm saying, you know, Given a C command, do something which will get us the response. Okay? Um, now, having got that far, uh, so think of this thing. If you imagine uh, that, um, yeah, let's suppose we want to write a function uh, whose type, which has a dependent function type, pi st. So inputs are s's and outputs are t's, depending on the s's. But uh, we don't know if it terminates. We don't know if our recursive function terminates. What, what can we do? Um, uh, we can. Uh, um, uh, well, imagine you have some sort of external oracle that offers to handle all your recursive calls for you. 
then you could explain what your strategy is for using that oracle to do anything, any recursive invocation that you need. So you can give this type. So this type explains how to do a finite unfolding uh, of one call uh, into perhaps a bunch, but delivering the same answer type. So this is one way to model a general recursive process, is just to say, how will one invocation lead to a bunch of sub-invocations, uh, which, if they get responses, will deliver an answer. Then you get uh, the opportunity to write uh, the sort of general purpose uh, uh, interpreter for this thing, which says, if you give me a kind of a, a amount of gasoline, and one of these things that can expand on demand uh, the call structure, then, well, let's see if given an input, the number of, the depth of expansion we have permitted is enough to get us the output. Um, uh, but the point then is this, uh, that your, uh, your general recursive programming exercise uh, becomes, you, you uh, uh, you work monadically, and any time you want to make a recursive call, instead of literally invoking the thing you're defining, you perform this call operation. And then this um, uh, gasoline function is one way, it's only one way of interpreting such a process as something you can, you can run. So I recommend that you choose uh, your favourite potentially non-terminating algorithm, uh, e.g. reduction for the untyped land calculus, um, and you, um, uh, you write the monadic version of the program you would have written anyway with one of these calls in the recursive places and then have fun. Uh, seeing whether you can feed it enough gas uh, for it to produce an answer. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's the, the situation there. Uh, so yeah, I guess there was one other thing I wanted to say before we stop, and we should stop very soon, um, which is just uh, to talk about uh, differentiating containers. Um, because uh, I mean, on the one hand, we've discovered that they look an awful lot like power series, and we sort of know that, well, then in that case, the derivative should be something like um, sum of the S and S's, P of S times x to the p of s minus 1. I mean, that's the sort of, just sort of following the high school cargo cult approach. This is what we would write down, right? That's how you differentiate the sum of exponentials. Um, and uh, we, uh, well, the only thing that's problematic about this is that we don't know how to subtract 1. Uh, but we can, um, we can be a little bit more uh, proof relevant about it. I mean, that's the thing. We're not just doing combinatorics. Uh, the, um, uh, the individual data have their own identities. So it's not enough to count them. You don't necessarily just subtract one. You subtract a particular one. So we can define uh, this 
uh, concept, the idea of, of subtracting a particular element from a set, that just means choosing some element of the set which isn't that one. And then we can write down uh, the, um, uh, the derivative, where we just say, okay, now as well as choosing a shape structure, we choose one position for that shape. And then the positions in the derivative are all the positions from the original except the one that we chose. So it corresponds to uh, adding an extra factor of a, of a position and taking that position away. So essentially cutting a little divot around one position. So now the shape carries an S and a P telling you where the divot is, and the edge, which is where you attach elements, has one position fewer. Um, so you can see from this sort of power series story exactly geometrically why there is this connection between uh, derivatives of one whole context. It's actually choosing where the hole is and saying stuff's not there anymore. Uh, so yes, so there are lots of uh, fun exercises um, uh, which involve, uh, involve those things, including finding container morphisms that witness these uh, uh, 17th century nuggets of German wisdom. Um, and, uh, 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 and, and you know more besides. Uh, so yes. So uh, I guess to sum up, containers they give in this sort of very pleasantly uniform style. Just just by having you know shapes and positions, uh, they give a way to get a handle on lots of kinds of, of data structures uh, and concepts and operations on data structures like, uh, like the derivative. Uh, yeah. Weak point is, as you'll discover, you know, fixed point representations of, of things like the natural numbers don't quite give you everything you want, but they're a really important conceptual tool. You need to, it's good to be able to see the shapes and position structure in things which might not be presented directly as containers, but nonetheless uh, behave like them, but nonetheless have a container representation. So I shall stop there, almost on time. Excellent.